You love Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. You can love because he first loved you. Amen. You couldn't love unless his love touched your heart. He his father, you were a dead pile of flesh, lost, yeah. done. You know, Paul talked about his his dad being crucified with Christ. I've just seen it the other day in the scripture. I've never seen it before. Wow. Some people say it's not a product, it's crucifixion. You don't talk when I'm doing my joke, bro. Like this, you have a little etiquette. Oh. Um, Paul said, "My old man." He said, "My old man was crucified with the Lord." So his dad, you know, bad joke. <laughs> I got it. It took a little bit. <laughs> Somebody tried to sell me a coffin yesterday. I said, "That's the last thing I need." <laughs> but listen, man, um, God is good. Uh, uh, turn your Bible to. Um, Hebrews, somewhere, somewhere in Hebrews, somewhere in Hebrews. Um, uh, praise the Lord, Father. We worship you, we magnify your name, we glorify your name, we bless you. Now I gotta, I gotta tell you guys something. The Lord is, um, He's changing things to where the God has poured out His Spirit in the uh, last days on all flesh. The sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men, uh, dream dreams, visions, you know, all of the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit, they're flowing. Satan knows his time is short, so he's ramping things up. So we have two sides of this thing really yeah. just going like this. Yeah. Now you all get out there and vote, and vote for Jesus, okay? Vote the way Jesus would vote. How would he vote? Well, he wouldn't vote against Israel. <coughs> he wouldn't vote for gay marriage because he never set that up. He wouldn't vote to kill babies and rip them out. And Kamala is basically campaigning on killing babies. And um, I don't know, man. She's got nothing. Just pretty much kill babies and Donald Trump, you're Hitler. Okay? No. We've been with Trump for four years. You can't lie about that. Don't lie. He wasn't Hitler. He might be a little rough around the edges, but he had pretty good policies, you know? So just vote for Jesus. But I got to say this. Whoever gets into office, whatever happens, God wins. Amen. Because Amen. we read the book. Amen. And I want you to know that you and I are part of a kingdom that shall see no end. When this election is over, there's going to be another election. And another election. Maybe someday uh, America will get really good into coming into unity and walking with God and get, you know, in, in, the, in the right place. And we're praying for a reprieve for America. We're praying that God forgive us for our, our, our iniquities of, of murder of babies and everything. We're asking for God's mercy and His grace and God's blood to wash America. But I'm going to tell you something. If you look at Israel, and you look at Israel and, and what happened with them, they had some good leaders and they had some bad leaders and they had some people in between, right? But what happened was is when people would worship God, when the church and the Levites we're putting God first, and there wasn't a perversion and a corruption, and there was worship, and there was adoration. What happened was, is there brought a blessing on the land. Okay? And so our real fight, even though we need to get out the vote, that's not the main. Our real fight is against spirits of darkness. True enemies that you cannot see, that are more real than you sitting here. You go, I don't believe in, I don't know if I believe in the unseen. Listen, for, bro, you're faker than the unseen is. You come from the unseen. This physical world is less real than the unseen. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Everything that you see is coming from the unseen. So you're less real than, than, than that. And so sometimes we come into a worship service and we say, well, was it any good? Well, brother, I just, you know, I didn't feel it this morning. I, um, they didn't play the song that I, I was liking, and my genre, this and that. And we got to change all that. Yeah. Because I'm going to tell you what, I got news for every one of us. God's changing things around the church. First of all, we're not going to have superstars. We're not going to have a, a podium and a pulpit where people get up and they're honored and they're blessed and they're praised. No, God is honored, blessed, and praised. Amen. That's number one. Number two is instead of the worship people singing and playing and worshiping God, God's going to have it in you, in the 
church, in the body of Christ. And it's not going to be a stage that's in the church. It's going to be a presence that's in heaven, that you're standing before the king in the throne room. You are the remnant church. You move the needle. And that's why I was saying today, when you lift up Christ, man, Satan gets his throat cut. How do I know this? I was in different countries where there was a lot of demonic forces. And the Lord told me, worship heavy, worship heavy. And so I started worshiping, just like a tidal wave of fire. And, and, and God's fire boom, consumed out and blasted the devil, destroyed him. That's why I was telling you guys, worship this morning to just stomp on the devil. You're going to wear ice skates and you're going to skate across the devil's throat. You're going to cut his throat with your, your speed skates, you know. You ever seen those guys dress up in the tights? <laughs> they got those long skates. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, what that's what you do. Yeah. But you just, you know, it's not by works. So city man should boast. This isn't a religious thing. This isn't you working harder. This is you understanding who God is and forgetting about yourself, denying yourself and concentrating on him and worshiping Amen. him Amen. and inviting him into the scene. And so, you know, just practically speaking, this brother was sharing this, that, you know, if you went to a, a birthday party and you had a six-year-old nephew you wouldn't stop you know you had a terrible day man maybe everything went wrong on the job terrible day and you and your and, and your sister brother and lady and your nephew's birthday party and, and you say you know what i'm not going because you know i had a bad day no you realize it's not about you you go there and you're pouting over in the corner and everybody's singing happy birthday to a six or eight year old and you're like man what's wrong with you i had a bad day None of that happens. It's not about you. You say, I'm not going to buy a gift. I had a bad day. No, no, no. With natural stuff, we get it. But with spiritual stuff, we get weird. Don't be weird. Be practical. Who, if, if, if Reuben wrote a love song to his girlfriend, okay, we wouldn't come in and critique it and go, well, Reuben, I wasn't really feeling that. You know, I didn't really like the words you used. It's not about you, you moron. You know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, that's a little strong, but when we're coming in and we're worshiping God, well, how is the worship service? Ask Him. There you go. Ask the Lord, not you. It wasn't for you. He is the one that spilt His blood when I was nasty, undone in sin, death, going to hell, and loved me when I didn't deserve it. He's the one that gave it all. He's the one to be worshiped, not you. It's not how you feel. It's not whether you like the song or not. It's about forgetting about all that. Come on. Pushing it out and concentrating on Him and worshiping Him. And if you can do that in a public setting, in a private setting, my friend, you will destroy the works of the devil in your life and other people. So you'll see a change. Now, um, you're going to push back the forces of darkness. You're going to push it back. When I was little, I remember my mom's a glow meeting, went to go pray because these witches were going to summon the dead there in Woodburn, Oregon. She went and they were praying the spirit around there and they're like, we can't do it. There's so much interference. We can't hear. We can't see. They just pulled up and left out of there. But you have authority over the power of the devil. You do. Yes. You, 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 have, you have the victory. You have the almighty God the creator of heaven and earth living in you. You have authority and you have power. Do you guys know what the difference between authority and, and, and power is? Do you know the difference? There's a little cop. He was a little, a little guy, real short. He got called out on this uh, call and they call him out and says, hey, get out of here, man, the domestic violence. So this big old biker, big old white biker, tossing around this this lady, you know, drunk, got drunk. And so he's knocking on the door. Open up. This guy was the door. He's just a little cop. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm requesting backup. I got to take this guy in on domestic violence. He's like, because <laughs> the, the lady calls back on the radio. She's like, everyone's tied up. You're by yourself. You got to handle it. And he's like, ah, oh, looks like it's you and me, little partner. <laughs> you know, you think you're going to haul me in? <laughs> and the little guy's like, Come with me, get in the back of the car. He's like, you heard him, there's no backup. You want a piece of me? 
He calls in. He's like, listen. He's like, listen, come on a ride. Come, come with me. No, no, no. Guy's resisting. He's like, let's go. And then the, guy, the cop calls in. He says, listen, I need another backup. I need an ambulance. I got a victim shot in the head and the chest. And he goes, whoa, hold on, man. And, he, and, and the cop says, well, you, refers, you refused the first ride, so I arranged another one for you. Yeah. On his gun. Remember Pastor Bob telling that story? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't I know you did because you weren't here. Yeah. But, yeah, but I'm telling you there's a difference between authority and power. So that was for yeah. us to remind us that, and Jose too, he wasn't here to hear that, but we have the authority and the power against the devil. And, then, and when we worship God, man, we destroy his works. We destroy the devil's works. We worship God, it brings his presence, it brings his, his fire. And so I just want to encourage you guys, when it comes down to worship, um, just forget about yourself. Yeah. Don't ask yourself, did I like it, did I not like it? Man, sometimes the Lord will literally catch you up, and you'll be loaded. I mean, you'll be high. You'll be so drunk, you'll be like, my goodness, that was good. I, got, I, I really got blasted, you know? And I enjoy that, and I'm thankful for that. But I don't just worship God when I feel like it. I worship God when I don't feel like it, because He's worthy Amen. of all honor, Amen. of all praise, of all glory. Now let's look at, um, let's look at, uh, well, Hebrews, I was just going to bring out this scripture. It says, because you hated iniquity oh, and loved righteousness, <laughs> I've exalted you above your fellows. And he was really talking about Jesus in that. Okay? But I'm saying to you, if you hate iniquity and love righteousness, God will exalt you above your fellows. He'll bring you up. Now, we were at a conference um, here this last week about, um, about worship and habitation. And it was really, really powerful. And uh, the thing that the Lord put in my heart mainly from the conference was to spend... Um, more alone time with him and how um, a lot of the things that are uh, getting done in the supernatural are not done at the meetings but it's done with our alone time with the Lord when he says you shut the door and then he says you know hey pray go in your room shut the door now we have corporate prayer right where we come together we pray together we pray in the tongues but we need to also have private prayer where we're coming in. And so sometimes people think like, um, you know, uh, that the speakers or the worship team is like, oh man, they're anointed, they're powerful. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to see people like those little old ladies, that one blind lady from, um, I think it was Scotland. And her and her friend, two women, cried out for revival in, in uh, the Everleys until it came. And so we've got giants we have giants spiritually many times that we don't recognize. We have authority and faith that can be used that we don't recognize because we spend too much time on the natural, um, the Facebook, the messenger, the fighting things on that realm. And we need to go higher to a higher realm yeah. like Elijah did where he called and he said, no, I'm not going to have it rain here, you know, and all that. But. Let's look, and I was talking about that the other day. Let's look at, um, um, man, man, man. let's talk about, let's look at Malachi here. Um, and let's look at four, at verse four. And they were talking about this on the, on the meeting of uh, this week. And they were, they were looking at this a little bit. The Holy Spirit, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for you touching our hearts this morning. For supernatural things happening even right now. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I command him in the world for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you a light of the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children of the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And um, this, um, here he was talking about um, Elijah coming. Okay. He was talking about Elijah coming. I'm going to send Elijah. Um, remember, 150 years after David, there was such perversion with Ahab marrying Jezebel. 
and all these false idols that were there. Baal. Baal worshippers, right? Yeah. And so um, Elijah called for it not to rain. It didn't rain. He didn't get on there and fight them on a, on a natural level. He went above. Way above. <laughs> to the courts of heaven. And he called for, for it not to rain, and it didn't rain. And, and this voice of Baal was killing the prophets, trying to silence the prophets. And there's an attitude that people want us to have this day to where we, they want us not to speak the truth. The Bible is the whole answer for all of your problems and the world's problems. <coughs> and we've got to speak it loud fast and continuous because you're not helping anybody if you don't tell them the truth of the word. You're killing them. You're hating them. Now we do it in a way where we do it with compassion. We cry out, hey brother, the Lord loves you. You're valuable. Receive. Amen. Amen. And so we're, we're crying out to the lost and broken. We're showing them the goodness of God. But we're not compromising telling them they're okay. Or that um, they can be the way they are. No, we're, we're calling out. And um, Elijah was like, listen, you're either going to serve God, either he's real, or Baal's real. It wasn't no, no, um, there wasn't no compromise. You're either in or you're out, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like, hey, I can have a foot in both worlds. And um, so here he talks about restoring the family, restoring all this. And then we turn over here in, um, uh, to the New Testament. And, and Jesus said, John the Baptist is Elijah, if you can receive him. The first part. You had 400 years span. You got the Maccabees. If you guys ever read those in the Catholic Bible, it talks about the history. There's some kind of cool stories they can make some movies about with the Maccabees. Different wars that took place, whatever. You get to the New Testament... And you see John the Baptist coming on the scene. And he's pointing to Christ saying, hey, this is the one. This is the Messiah. This is God. He's pointing to him. <coughs> and, uh, you know, the thing is, is that, is that we, we're living in a world right now where families are being torn apart. Just totally ripped apart. And in Malachi here, he says here, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. He's talking about the restoration of family. When God made humans, he did not make a business or a religion. He didn't say, well, I'm going to make a nice 501c3 nonprofit. That's why I'm going to create humans. <laughs> and it wasn't for a business. So people could get up here and say, brother, if you plant a seed, you'll reap a harvest. As long as that seed's planted into my ministry, <laughs> You're going to receive a true portion back, you know. None of this, this kind of business. It was for family. It was for people. Jesus said in John 4, I've been waiting a long, long time for true worshipers. This worship in spirit, truth, Amen. family members, people Amen. that are born again. They're made in my image and my likeness. Because even King David, in his great worship, even in his great worship, he, uh, he was worshiping out of the soul. He didn't have a new nature. He was looking forward to it. Come on. Now you have a new born again nature. And listen, King David, he was extravagant with the worship. Extravagant. Saying, God, I want to build you a temple. I want to build you a place. He wanted to. And God said, no, your son's going to do it. You have a lot of blood shed on your hands. Your son's going to do it. Solomon's going to do it. And, but his heart was to build that tabernacle for God. You are not now God's temple. You are the place where God dwells. Come on. When Jesus died and rose from the dead... The veil in the temple that kept the Holy of Holies, it ripped. Some people say there's a thick leather, huge thickness that two oxen couldn't even pull them apart if you had a rope tied to it. But when the presence of God came, when Jesus rose from the dead, it, the veil ripped and his presence went out. And then his spirit came in Acts. It's, this spirit came. Did you know how God's spirit came? The Holy Ghost in Acts. Do you know how he came? He came in the upper room with fire. Do you, know, do you know what really transpired under that? There was a man who wasn't a Jew. He didn't have any religious background. His name was Cornelius. 
And he was praying and giving to God. He was hungry for God, didn't know God. And God said that Cornelius' giving and his prayers came up before me like a sweet smell. And so he got an angel, God got an angel to get to Peter to give him the truth of the gospel. Because of his actions in his heart. And then the Holy Ghost came on all us Gentiles. We, we got the Holy Ghost. We got the gift. We got the presence of God. The, the temple was so holy that if a man walked in there and he wasn't right, they would fall down dead. And they used to tie a rope around the ankle of the priest. And if he went in there and he didn't, wasn't right, they would have a bell on his foot and a rope. And that way, if he fell out under the, the presence of God because he wasn't right and he died, they didn't want to die either. So they were smart. The Jews are smart people. They are very smart. I like how they did that whole like uh, James Bond thing with the pagers and the phones. Man, I was like, how do they do that? Get all these pagers from Hezbollah on the terrace and somehow reroute them to a different place, put little bombs in them, and then ship them back on the order? That's amazing spy work. Anyways, they're very gifted. At any rate, they're thinking, man, Larry, you want to go and get, you know, Delbert? He just passed. He yelled at his wife this morning, went in the Holy Holies, he died. Yeah, no, you get him, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> hey, man, I, you know, they tie a rope, <laughs> they pull him out. But there's a difference between the temple and the synagogue. The synagogue had a lot of people in it, and it was for the people. The temple was for God, God's presence, God's habitation. You're to be God's habitation. Don't grieve the Spirit. And don't quench the Spirit. What do you mean? Grieving the Spirit is when you're doing stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. Quenching the Spirit is when you're not doing stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. The Lord tells Levon, Levon, go share the gospel with this guy over here. And Levon's like, man, I don't, I don't want you on this and that. You quench the Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells Levon, Levon, call up this brother and encourage him. He's going through something. Levon's like, I just want to get a pizza. You're quenching the Spirit. But let's say Levon's sitting there and he's chilling in the parking and he sees somebody, you know, <laughs> that's drinking, a, uh, you know, some spirit ops or something. <clears throat> he's like, you know, I think I'll partake. <laughs> no? That's grieving the Spirit. Because the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's a difference between grieving the Spirit and quenching the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is in you. In the Old Testament, if you study all the miracles of the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come on people. The Spirit of God came on Samson. He took a donkey's jawbone and killed a thousand men. That's not natural. And you know, when I was a little boy and, and, and I saw in the Bible, my little Bible, my little children's Bible, I had Samson with huge muscles. But I don't know if he did. Later on, I was in the spirit, and I was I was reading the word and praying. I don't think Samson did have big muscles, because it says right there. They said, Samson, what is the source of your strength? <laughs> so if he looked like he was Arnold Schwarzenegger, they'd be like, well, he eats a lot of protein and works out. Huh? But if they're saying, what's the source of your strength? How did you rip two thousand pound ga gates right off their hinges and run up and set them on a hill? They're like, this is unnatural, this is supernatural. What's the source of it? They wouldn't ask that if he was a mammoth of a man. Just a thought. The Spirit wants to dwell and abide in you. He wants to fellowship with you all the time. Amen, brother, amen. He wants to hang out with you. The Spirit comes when I ride my motorcycle and he rides with me and we talk. When I go out to the woods and I'm, you know, shooting at a target with all my guns and I'm having fun just shooting my guns, the Spirit is with me and enjoying the afternoon shooting at targets. When I go down and witness to people, He's with me. All the time. That's why, you know, the Bible says don't join yourself to a harlot. What would Christ and a harlot have in common? Now the other night, yes. So the other night I had a dream. I'm sitting there and I'm in my dream 
I'm with a, a Russian friend of mine, Paul Shevchuk, and he's an old time friend, We've known him for many years. Come, we met, you know, at Dave Roberson's ministry down there in Tulsa, and we're in a mall, and Paul starts telling these people, not a mall, it was like a public place, but it had wood background. There's these people there, and, and Paul says, hey guys, I want to tell you about Jesus. And all of a sudden, like, he's, like, quiet and not talking, really. And he, he kind of stops. And like, What's the problem? What, what's going on? You know, but I wasn't even thinking about evangelizing these people. I wasn't even thinking on it. Uh, yeah. And then Paul's like, hey, man, can you finish it? I'm like, sure. And so I, I share a simple gospel with them, and they pray to receive Jesus. And then I wake up. And then I, I'm asking my wife, what do you think the interpretation of this dream is? She goes, well, maybe you're supposed to do something with the, um, the Slavic church, you know? It's like, maybe. But I think, and maybe that's true, but I think what it was is I wasn't even thinking about winning these souls. I wasn't even thinking about these people. He was. I think the dream was that somebody, some people are prepared for sharing the gospel, but they're not doing it. And other people are, are, are not prepared for the gospel, to share the gospel, and they need to be prepared because there's a harvest. And, um, you know, after that happened, I felt the Spirit say to me, you need to, through the course of the day, be winning souls because I put that on you. And so the other day, um, I shared with the tow truck dump driver, he got saved. And then yesterday I was down in a car lot picking up a car, and... Um, there was a gentleman that um, came through the ministry here that did some armed robberies and some, he did some kidnapping. He had uh, several life sentences. He was a hardcore felon. When he was young, um, I, I remember over in Kaufman hearing on the police scanner or something that there was going to be a big gang fight. And so I ran over there and I was trying to preach to these guys involved in the gangs because I'd done a lot of street ministry in the inner city. And... Um, they weren't having it. They had pipes, chains, bats, all that, but they weren't really, they weren't really getting down. One time in Portland, I, I was, I was approaching these guys doing a big drug deal. I was like, "Hey, man!" And they all looked like that. And I reached back here to grab some tracks. They're all reaching for peace. And I was like, "Hold on! I didn't come to you with a gun. I came to you with the sword of the spirit. Yeah. And it's the word of God. He loves you, you know." And, and my friend from the army is like, you're nuts, man. You interrupt the drug deals to share the gospel. <laughs> I'm like, they're great ministers because they're not scared of dying. Yeah. And they've already had such a crappy life in the penitentiary. They yield to God more. It's not by works. It's by yieldedness. And many people that have many things in the natural, much money and much success, it's hard for them to let that go and lean on Jesus. Because when I have such richness, I'm so confident, and everybody calls me, you know, they're, hey, you're the... You're the cat's meow. They roll the red carpet out for you in the city. You're holding on to all of this. Jesus is over there and saying, let go of this and hold on to my hand. But it's hard for people with a lot of intelligence, a lot of money, a lot of gifts to let go of this and reach over here and, and, and grab the Lord because they're so confident in this. And they've worked so hard to build this up. So it's, but a guy that's lost everything is like, what do I got to lose? Yeah, Lord, you take my life. I got three life sentences anyway. Not that I want any of you guys to do prison time or anything you know, like that. And God does use rich, successful people. And there are people that's yielded. But it's a constant struggle in humans to yield. Yep. We want to control. We want to do it. And it's like, you know what Captain Coleman said? One of the greatest ministers of our time. She says, Lord, I don't have many musical gifts. I'm not that pretty. I, I, I don't have much to give you. I'm just going to give you myself. God, you are so great. And she was weeping one time. She came to the auditorium and many people healed the living set free. She said, listen. She says, this walk with the Lord has cost me everything. But it's worth it. Amen. It's been so worth it. And guys, today you're faced with situations like this. Moses was offered all the riches of Egypt, being in the Pharaoh's seat, all this and that. And he did something at that time that would have looked silly to leave all that and go with the slaves and support them. But now in history, you don't remember those Pharaohs. 
Moses' name is the one that everybody remembers. He's the one that, that they know. Listen, Amen. after the word of God. Here's, here's what the Lord is asking of you and I today. Wow. When the Spanish came to America, wow. and the Spanish were some warriors. They were brutal warriors. They were facing millions of Aztecs or Mayans or I forget who they were fighting. That's much of history. You had a lot of different crazy people in South America, too, doing a lot of human sacrifices between the Mayas and the Aztecs. We've been down there praying for them breaking the power of the devil in that innocent blood that was shed down there. It cursed the land. We're going to break the curse of the blood of Jesus in Central and South America. But they turned around and they said, we're going to conquer this land. You know what they did? They burned the ships. There is no going back. Reuben sent me something on the Navy SEALs on who makes it and who doesn't. And, it, and it's not always the smartest and it's not always the strongest. It, it, it's the ones that are, are really determined, I'm going to do this. I remember a Navy, Navy SEAL talking to us one day and they, he was telling us that, you know, he had gotten, um, he, all his team died except for one guy, him. And he was pinned down in Iraq under the enemy lines. And he had like a fracture that was so bad it was compound where the bone had come off. And the pain was killing him so hard. But it was his training of being able to overcome the, the I can'ts in his mind and mustering up the I can. And so he's able to hobble and walk on this compound fracture and get away and save his life. But there comes a, a moment in your life where you cross the line and say, you know what, my marriage might be hard, but I'm not giving up on it because the Word of God tells me to love my wife even though I don't want to. You come and you cross the line in the Gospel and you say, man, I'm going to win souls even though I don't want to because these people are going to hell. I've got the answer in my life and I love them and I'm going to do it because, Amen. you know what, I cross the line. There's decisions that you make Amen. and you cross the line and say, I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care if I live or die. I'm going to come serve on. God. Come on. Amen. Heidi Baker told the story of these guys in Africa. I'm going to close with this. I've been in Africa and seen people that had such commitment to Christ. And, you know, in America, we get a little bit fat, dumb, lazy, weak. We think Christianity is about us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about lifting him up. It's about doing his will. This dude went to this village to preach the gospel. These people didn't receive it. And I think it may have even been Muslim, and they cut his finger off. And his family was there too. Then they cut his hand off. And they said, nobody's going to preach the gospel. No, you're never going to preach the gospel again. You're never going to tell people about Jesus. Then they cut off his feet. Then, by, by the time it's all said and done, they cut off his lips. And then they cut off his head. Oh my gosh. In front of his family. And his brother went to the prison where this man was held that killed him. Because murder is illegal in Africa. And the, the cop said, do you want to release him? Do you, want, do you want to hold this against him? He went to the man and said, I forgive you and I love you. And the man got born again. And he says, I'm going to release him on one condition, that he goes with me to that village and preaches the gospel. And they went there and thousands got saved. But in America, you would be like, this guy did this. Uh, this guy's going to pay a hard time, this and that and the other. But there's a different understanding, even little kids where their families in witchcraft because they grow up in an ancestral worship and where they're ministering, where their family does insane, torturous things, they're able to forgive them and break the power of the devil and walk out because they don't have this weird, manipulated mindset. They see the beauty of Christ. They see the forgiveness of Christ. They see it. I was in um, Costa Rica ministering in a prison. And I, I was there, and the, and the power of God came through so wonderfully. And these men that were bound with devils, rah, they all of a sudden started manifesting, just contorting, demons coming out of people, people getting born again, this and that. And this dude was sitting there, he's like, hey, do you want to come preach at, at, at our church? I said, sure. I went there, and there was thousands of people at his church. And um, we ministered there, and I sat down and ate with that man, and I heard his story. The guy that was preaching prison, he goes, yeah, a while ago, I, I'm an assistant pastor. But he said, you know, I was in this prison myself, and I come here. I came there and ministered, but he said, my son was killed by these group of people in the cartel. And the Lord had me go minister and win them to the Lord and all that and bring them into Christ. And I was like, brother, in America, people, they miss the gospel. They don't, they don't understand the power of the love of God. They don't understand the depth and the limit that Jesus went. And just this week, and I've been connected with somebody that had killed her 20-year-old-month-old baby when um, 
she was into witchcraft and did 20 years, just got out of prison. And she called me this last week, and I've been co connected with the family, just breaking the power of the devil. And um, we're going to pray for her and see God do a work because Amen. the Lord is able, his blood is able to forgive the worst thing that you can imagine. It reaches to the highest mountain, and it goes to the lowest valley. It's the blood oh, of the yeah. Lamb. And you either believe it or you Amen. don't. You're either a two-faced punk or you're legit. You're in. You either believe that God is real and he's able to do the supernatural and he does Amen. forgive the worst thing. And he can't rip the worst, worst witchcraft person out. Of Look, we're going to have a church filled with people with tattoos, even though I don't personally like tattoos. We're going to have a church filled with people with, um, man, when I got saved, my, my pastor took off his shirt. I was traveling with him. I never seen such artwork of tattoos on a man's back. He spent 16 years in San Quentin prison. My pastor did. He's one of the boldest men that ever. He's the only one I knew that ever broke into a prison to go preach the gospel after 30 people were killed. It takes no fear to do that. But love drives you to do things that, look, I just want to hear God's voice. Do you? Do you really want to hear God's voice? Are you really in that camp or are you just talking? Because God's voice says things like this in the midst of a storm where a boat's even going to sink. Hey, Peter, get out and walk on water. Come oh, come on. God's voice is not safe. Many times it's reckless. God's voice says like, how long am I going to be with you? How long am I going to have to do things for you? You wicked and unbelieving generation. Believe! It calls you up to a higher place. God's voice says things that are like, whoa, next out there, beyond your ability, but in his ability it's normal. Amen. Yeah, you do want to hear his voice. And you do want to live that life because you want to live before you die. You don't want to live a natural life. You want to live, live a supernatural life. You want to live a life, a, a, an uh, awesome yeah, life. Yeah, the Lord, the Lord stirred me up about evangelism in that dream. And so, you know, when I'm out there, I'm sharing. And just yesterday, I went to the car lot and I shared this story about this man who was in the men's home that he knew and all the dirt. He said, man, that guy got several prostitutes for us. You're telling me he's serving Jesus? I said, yes. I'm like, if you were to die right now, do you know if you go to heaven? He goes, I don't know. Then he received Jesus right there. Amen. He says, you know, my girlfriend one time prayed for me when I was on an overdose. And I felt demons pulling me down to hell. And uh, she was using the name of Jesus, and she was praying in a strange language. I was like, was she praying in tongues? Yeah, I think that's, she got that imparted to her when she was 13 at a revival. And I said, well, do you want it? He goes, yeah. I'm going to call him. I didn't have time to pray with him on tongues and all that now, but I said, hey, brother, do you want to go with me to hit the homeless camps around here? Amen, amen. He goes, yeah, I'll go. I want to go, brother. Please. I want to go. Like and, so, and so, uh, you know, uh, the Lord is pulling people out who yeah. are willing. He's qualifying the willing, and he's leaving the, some of the people in church because they're too religious and comfortable. Don't be left behind. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be comfortable. Amen. I want God to pull me out of the comfortability and say, Yeah, Lord, I'll do it. I'll, I'll go. You know? And so, Lord, I just thank you. Amen. Good message. And I want, I want to tell you guys this. If you will set your love upon Jesus, he'll deliver you. There's some people in this room right now, you have unclean spirits. But the Lord's not telling me to pray for you. Here's how your deliverance is going to come. It's going to come the way of Psalms 91. When you set your love upon the Lord, He's going to deliver you. And He's going to set you free. Because your worship is just going to bring a freedom. Your adoration of the Lord Jesus is going to bring freedom. Because some of the areas you're bound, you want to be that way. And God's such a gentleman. He's not a terrorist like Satan. He's not going to go in and knock your door down. If you want to be in bondage, he'll leave you there. What are you saying, Pastor Mary? This is what I'm saying. God goes into the prison of your maximum security. And he pulls the bars apart. But you tell Jesus, thank you for getting me out of this 20-year life sentence. But Jesus, instead of me coming out of the penitentiary, can you bring me a, a big screen TV? Jesus, instead of getting me out of the penitentiary, can you bring me a nice, easy chair for myself? <laughs> he did not come to get you out of prison to make you more comfortable. God will take you out of the worst hell. 
He'll grab you and snatch you out of the grips of the devil like that man that was going to hell when his girlfriend prayed for him on an overdose and saved him probably from an eternity hell. He'll rip you out of there. But he won't get you out of your easy chair. If you want to sit there and keep drinking, if you want to smoke, he's not going to stop you. You're going to do it. And you're going to die. You're going to miss some of the things in your life because your rebellion and your wickedness and your loving iniquity more than God. He's not going to take away that porn. You're going to have to want to walk and love Jesus more than that centerfold. Come on. And you want to go to hell? Go for it. One man come up to me and he said, hey, listen. He goes, well, I have to give up marijuana if I come to Jesus. I said, I'm not going to pray with you to receive him. He said, why not? I said, because you need to see the beauty of Christ. What do you mean? I said, when you see who Jesus is and what he did, you're going to say, what can I give up to get closer to him? Amen. And it's not about giving things up. It's about loving Jesus. But it is about um, putting things down to defile the temple. It is about placing Jesus in the highest place. Amen. We don't save ourselves. Christ saves us. Amen. But we make a determination to walk out into the things of God. I had an inmate the other day that came out of prison that I've worked with for many years. He goes, you know what? Prison on the main line was much easier than this, even with all the politics and gangs and prison fights. Being a single dad is one of the worst things ever. <laughs> he goes, in there I could just play cards and, and dice and I got it all figured out. Man, this is a real challenge. So Lord, I thank you, God, that you're going to, Lord, you're going to, Lord, you're going to change and turn our hearts, God, from the wickedness that we've walked in. You're, Lord, going to reveal your beauty to us. And that we're going to stop looking at what we can get out of it. And we're going to stop looking at ourselves. And we're going to turn to you. Yes, Lord. We're going to put our sight on you. We're going to, Father God, fix our gaze on you. And Lord, we're going to turn, Lord, from our wicked ways of selfishness. And we repent this day. And we say, Lord Jesus, we're living for you. We deny ourselves. We pick up our cross and we follow you. We're willing, ready, able to be commissioned in the army. Yes, Lord. We're not backing down. What's left of our lives, you have. And you've given us this life. Use it for your glory. And we declare it now. And I looked up Job. I asked, Lord, that you would touch his body. Yes, I Heal his ribs, Lord. Heal his body. Heal his spirit, soul, and body. Heal his heart. Lord, let him, set him free from that nicotine. Yes, I set him free, Lord, from the wrong thinking. Set him free, Lord, from love and pleasure more than you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, snatch him up, Father God, in a mighty way. And Lord, let your truth come to him. Bless him. Touch him. Yes, save him. Use him. Yes, Lord, we invite you into every aspect of Joe's life. Yes, Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.